come along in 50 years and we'll latch on to that. But well, if, <laughs> if they had done that, they would be out of, out of a lot of progress that science has made in, in the intervening time. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and I, I view ID as the same thing. Who knows? You, you can never tell in science what's coming down the pipe. But right now, it sure looks this way to me that, uh, that things look strongly as if they were designed. Uh, and Darwinian claims notwithstanding, we have no uh, idea how such uh, elegant uh, complexity could have come about without design. So why don't we make that conclusion, or at least as a hypothesis, and, and go from there? I cannot believe that the typical view among scientists is such that they're not as fascinated by that question and this possible boundary to our knowledge that you are. It's, it's so utterly fascinating. And yet I remember when Darwin's Black Box came out, I grabbed it. I was fascinated by this. It opened my eyes. And I had a scientist friend, eminent one. I will not name them or even give their gender. But I had that scientist over to dinner. And when I gave that scientist your book and said, have you read this one, that scientist literally, and they, yes, singular they, were being kind of theatrical. But they literally threw it across the room. They just uh -huh. could not entertain that this book, and it was gaining a reputation, could possibly be making any sense. But of course, that wasn't a discussion. I could not get this person to discuss what was so wrong with the ideas. Nevertheless, I'm sure that people like, you know, Sean Carroll are scoffing at um, the edge of evolution um, to the extent that he has actually read it. Certainly, he feels that it's not even worth any kind of notice and that there are things you're leaving out etc. Also, the book came out two years ago, and I imagine you probably wrote it in 2005. Science proceeds quickly. What do you think a Sean Carroll, and I'm using him as a stand-in for all of these Evo Devo people who seem to think that they've got it all figured out, what would he say your mistake is? Because I'm sure you've thought about that. Where are you going wrong according to the conventional wisdom? Well, uh, let me just say that I know Sean Carroll. Sean Carroll is a friend of mine. Uh, and, uh, I actually, I just met him at a, at, a, at a recent evolutionary biology meeting a couple months ago. He's a real nice guy. So uh, you two can have beer and, and yeah, like, interact. Okay. Yeah, yeah we, we can talk. He, he's a friendly fellow. But uh, from his review, he reviewed the book for Science uh, Magazine. Uh, mm -hmm. His objections to it uh, were, were, were uh, simply wrong. He, he talked about... Uh, I, I, I pointed out in the book how protein-protein binding sites would be very difficult to, uh, to, to uh, get by random mutation and natural yeah. selection. And he thought, well, this, is, this would be easy. All you have to do is, uh, is make two amino acid changes or one amino acid change, and, and you'd have a new, brand-new binding site. And, no. Uh, but, but, he, <laughs> but you can't do that. And, and what... Uh, what um, what one sees when one looks at results such as the evolution of malaria in the wild is that his imagined new protein binding sites never show up. Uh, and yeah. neither, neither do they show up in, in experimental evolutionary uh, uh, laboratories when people are growing bacteria and trying to make them change. Uh, so all of his, his objections were, were easily answered. Uh, the, the big Big problem I had with the review was the tone of of scorn, as you as you said, the tone of scorn uh, that was in it. Clearly, these are questions that we don't know about yet, and you might yeah. you might take the position as a lot of people do that. Well, yeah, we don't know about it yet, but I'm not going down the design route. I don't think that's that's going to pan out. Well, okay, but to deny that Darwinism has these problems is kind of sticking your head in the sand. Yes. Why don't people understand the role of randomness and chance? I, I, yeah. We must have evolved in some way not to understand that readily. Or here, here's another question. I remember way back in the late 90s, I discussed your book with another biologist, and they said something which I have since read, and I think which you mentioned in The Edge of Evolution, which is that a few of the 
irreducibly complex things that you discussed in the first book have been found since to not be as irreducibly complex. And so your idea that you stressed particularly in Darwin's Black Box was that there are certain very complex structures or processes in how organisms work where it's impossible to imagine what the intermediate step would have been, kind of like the skunk's scent gland and squirting mm -hmm. process. And for example, one of them, and actually the one that gave me my epiphany in the first one, was um, blood coagulation. And you showed how there's this ridiculously Baroque process of you know, ca this cascade of chemicals that all end up interacting in order to create a clot. And there couldn't be an intermediate stage of this that would have served any purpose. It wouldn't create a blood clot, and so why would this have evolved in any way? Now, apparently, it's been shown since then that there are ways of going step by step and creating blood clotting. And so, doesn't I thought at that time, well, I guess they basically shot poor Michael Behe, you know, <laughs> down. I guess that takes care of his book. Apparently not, but how do you know there isn't going to be more of that in terms of, for example, this beautiful example that you give of the cilium, the hair-like structures, mm -hmm. and how utterly complex they are, such that it's hard to imagine anybody building one of these even on purpose, much less it happening randomly step by step. How do you know that there isn't going to be more of that, that people aren't going to take each one of these processes you identify and find that there were intermediate steps like they did with the blood? Well, I, I, I think what they're doing is that they're mistaking the idea of irreducible complexity. They're infusing what I think of as irreducible complexity with, with what they, you know, with their, their own ideas. They're, they think uh, that the idea of irreducible complexity is that you can't make a machine that does something similar to a, to the machine you're you're thinking about with fewer parts. But that <clears throat> that's not true. And I, and I wrote about that in Darwin's Black Box. I said, uh, as an example of irreducible complexity in our everyday world, I talked about a, a mouse trap, which has a number of parts. It's got a metal spring and a bar that smacks the mouse and a couple of others. But you can make mouse traps a number of different ways. You can take a box and prop it open with a stick, and, and that's a simpler mouse trap. But the question is, can you get to the mouse trap that we're talking about by numerous successive slight modifications, which Darwin insisted on, very small, tiny steps, random steps that are favored by natural selection. Uh, and a number of machines, uh, if they're complicated enough, they contain a number of different components uh, oh, let's let's talk about a, a car. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it contains a uh, an air conditioner, a fuel pump, and so on. You might be able to use those things for other purposes, but if you take out a fuel pump from a car, the car is not going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, so, unfortunately, some people, uh, kind of egged on by by the Darwinists, have said, "Well, if we can find any use at all for some part." of what I tagged an irreducibly complex system, then we can, we can uh, relieve our minds, we can declare it to be not irreducibly complex. But right. I, I, would, I would disagree that the blood clotting system was shown to not be irreducibly complex, or was shown to not be irreducibly complex. So uh, you're saying that these intermediate steps that they've come up with functions for, those functions are somehow not valid? That those aren't realistic reconstructions as to no, the, what the, these intermediate... In, in, in many cases, the functions are valid, but the question is, how do you get from one to the other by random mutation and natural selection? Uh, there's, mm -hmm. there's one, uh, there's, there's something called a bacterial flagellum. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's, it's kind of like a little uh, rotary motor, like an outboard motor. And, Fascinating. And I, I, I wrote about that in Darwin's Black Box and, and said it was irreducibly complex. And after the book came out, it was discovered that there was a subpart of it that could act kind of like a pump, kind of like, right. the, like the gas pump in your car. And some people said, well, if we take this away, it, it still works. Uh, so mm -hmm. there, therefore, the flagellum is not irreducibly complex. Uh, okay. But, but I counter that, well, no, it is, because when you take away that part, the flagellum no longer works as a as a uh, as a rotary motor. It's like mm -hmm. ta taking away the the an axle or something from an outboard motor and saying I can uh -huh. use, I can use this axle over here. Oh, and somebody said yes, but the outboard motor is broken. It, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it turns out that it's a lot harder than you know 
then these folks are giving a credit to actually construct an irreducibly complex system. They're they're kind of trying trying to backward engineer things, and it's right. you can easily get misled by your imagination as as uh, many Darwinists have throughout the past century or so. And I should specify that you um, agree that random mutation could create things on the level of, say, a species. And so you're not denying that you can certainly see finches beaks evolving on the basis of the Darwinian process. But your point is that we have no evidence that that process could create the difference between a finch and an anteater, and that something else must have been going on, especially because if that were going to happen, given how rare it is that we see mutations that actually convey some sort of advantage when we try to see it in the laboratory, there would have to have been a lot more time that the world had existed for there to be that kind of variety if it was conceivable at all. Is that a fair representation uh, of your point? Yeah, and, and the more you study it, I mean, if you look at, at the nuts, the molecular nuts and bolts of it all, uh, the more you, I doubt that it could happen at all, because it, it turns out a lot of the helpful mutations, the, the kind that, you know, give you antibiotic uh, resistance or that change color in a, uh, change a, an organism's color and maybe help it fit into an environment better, a lot of those, a lot of those uh, mutations are actually 